Mr. Chair, the meeting is now live. I'm not hearing anyone. Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Council members, uh, can you Mr. hear me? Blumenfield, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. I can hear everybody. I'm not hearing hear you. you. Can you hear us, Paul? No. And Andrew, we can hear you. Okay. Problem solved. My mistake. Uh, <clears throat> all right, Mr. Sub, we're ready to begin. The meeting is now live. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Budget Finance Committee meeting of October 25th, 2021. Uh, we're ready to begin today's agenda, so let's begin by calling the roll. Councilmember Kukorian. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Present. Councilmember De Leon. Absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Price. Present. Four members and a quorum. Thank you very much. And members, if you notice a distinctly different voice, uh, that is because uh, this is the first meeting for our new representative from the clerk's office, Andrew Su, uh, who's joining the Budget and Finance Committee team. Uh, Mandy Morales has served us for years uh, extraordinarily well, uh, and uh, she's uh, been taking on more than she can handle between Budget and Finance Committee and her other responsibilities. So I want to thank her very much uh, for all of her service and welcome Andrew to our team. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin by calling item number nine. Item number nine, our city administrative officer reports relative to the COVID-19 emergency response account general city purposes fund status report for the weeks ending October 1, 2021 through October 15, 2021. Good afternoon, Jennifer Shimatsu with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Before Good afternoon. The committee, before the committee, a weekly status reports of the approved expenditures from the COVID-19 emergency response account from the weeks ending October 1st through October 15th, 2021. As of October 15th, the remaining balance of this account is approximately 3.8 million. An additional 25 million remains in the unappropriated balance. I'm available for any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Very good. Uh, as is our practice, we'll be holding this one on the desk for the moment. But members, any questions at the moment for Mishimatsu? Okay, then uh, without objection, we'll go ahead and hold that one on the desk. Um, members, before we go to public comment, uh, we have a very full agenda today, including uh, our FSR. I wanted to just indicate what my proposals for consent approval will be. Uh, and then I'd also like each of you to give thought to which, if any, departments you'd like to call special uh, for further questioning on the FSR. So for consent, I'd propose on item number seven and eight that we approve the city attorney's recommendations. On item number 11, that we concur with the ITGS committee recommendations, <clears throat> excuse me, to approve the CAO's recommendations as amended on item number 12, that we approve the Collections Board of Review uh, recommendations. On item number 13, that we approve the Office of Finance recommendation to escheat $585,139.21 to the general fund. On item 14, that we note and file the item. On item 15, that we note and file the item on item 16, that we concur in the Plum Committee recommendation to approve the motion, on item 17, that we approve the motion, on item 18, that we approve the CAO's recommendations. So those will be my recommendations for consent uh, when we come back from, uh, when we complete uh, public comment. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and begin our public comment process. 
Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 1606553266 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for a participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. All right, let's go ahead and call our first speaker, please. Caller with the last Hello. Oh, there you are. Yes, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Tyler from Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and general public comment. Okay, one minute. Hi, so it's been four months since Mike Bonin introduced a motion to eliminate the LAPD practice of hiring above attrition, and it still hasn't made its way onto the Budget and Finance Committee agenda. So I'm urging you all, and to you specifically, Paul Krikorian as the chairman, to agendize the motion and then pass the motion so that way no new cops are in our communities. It will defund the police by $18 million, and we can invest in mental health resources for our communities and so many other services that our communities desperately need. So please agendize the motion and pass it and I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, this is Richie Serdenko from the People's City Council. Just general public comment, please. Very good. One minute. Go right ahead. Yes, I'm calling in in solidarity with People's Budget LA and Black Lives Matter LA and calling to ask, you know, Chair Krikorian, why hasn't Mike Bonin and Nithya Raman's motion for no new cop, um, that would, you know, the motion is put forward to reduce hiring and recruitment of police to tran and transfer yeah, eighteen million to support unarmed crisis response programs. Um, it's been over four months, so the question is, Chair Corian, why haven't you scheduled it to be agenda? Um, you know, it, why is it being stalled out in the City Council Budget and Finance Committee? And you're the chair of the committee, Paul. So, do you have an answer for this? Like, why? Why is this happening? Um, the people have been demanding to defund the police, and we want you to agendize the motion. Um, we need these resources in our communities. Um, and so seriously, Paul, why aren't you agendizing the no new cops motion? People are calling and we want to get it passed. Um, what's the holdup? It's been four months. Um, and so I'm just calling in to demand that you agendize the, the no new cops motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello, I'd like to speak on all available items and after general public comment, my name is Stella Suarez Hamilton. All right, you have two minutes on the topics that are on our agenda and then one minute on general public comment. Thank you. And your repeated abuse of the First Amendment is disgraceful. So Stick for to the item nine and the agenda. Ten, for item nine and ten, excuse me, sir, stop interrupting me. Stop you'll it. speak to the for items item on the 10. agenda or you'll go to your general. For item 10, for item 10, sir, for item 10, the COVID emergency fund, I am going to quote the Declaration of Independence of the United States for item 9 and 10. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with many firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. Those are from the grievances of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount of payment of their salaries. We the people demand a redress of the vaccine proof ordinance, discrimination, Jim Crow, and a violation of our Constitution First Amendment rights, just like you tried to do right now, sir. 
a disgrace. God bless you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And for the record, as we're getting to the next speaker, I do want to note also that Mr. De Leon has joined the meeting. We have all five members present. Go right ahead with the next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 7786. Please dial star six to unmute. Please state your name Hi, and name if you'd like to speak on. My name is Jasmine Delgado, resident of Delray. Um, I'd like to speak on item number 10. Um, I would like right ahead, one to... Okay. Um, I want to say that spending $2 million on signages that people aren't going to expect regardless is going to set up, is just a setup for failure. Homeless people don't have alternatives that you guys are not providing, and this signage does nothing but further criminalize them and push them into spaces where they're not supposed to be seen, where they will get less resources, where they're, where they're at further risk of being harmed because they're not being seen. Um, and I completely do not agree with item 10. You guys should not be spending $2 million on signages. That's going to be such a stain on your part in history. Imagine those pictures in history books. No homeless people can live here. What is that going to look like in history books? That you supported that shit. I yield my time. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yes, my name is Akili with Black Lives Matter of LA. Public comment. Good afternoon. One minute. Yes, my public comment is on agendizing the Bonin Nissan motion. It's been four months. Um, and this is part of the reason why people don't trust and or like the city council because they don't do things that they said they would do. This is, it has been four months. There's no reason not to do it unless you're avoiding having a discussion about no new cops, unless you're avoiding having uh, a discussion about the defund uh, and divest invest that many of us have been calling for, unless you are avoiding and dismissing Black Lives Matter and the People's Budget LA. So we are calling on you, uh, Chairman Kikorian, to agendize uh, the People's Budget LA and Black Lives Matter demand no new cops. And all you have to do is put it on the agenda. Uh, if you don't do it, then we would want you to keep the name Black Lives Matter out your mouth. And don't you ever, ever, ever come around, support, or in any way imply that you have black support or even understand the conditions, uh, uh, concerns, and issues of black folks. We're asking you to agendize this item and to do your job. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Robin Gilliam. This is in regards to agenda item 11. All right. One minute. Go right ahead. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Robin Gilliam, and I serve as the Public Policy and Advocacy Director for Arts for LA. We are the regional arts and culture advocacy organization representing 75,000 art advocates and 185 arts and culture organizations. We urge the committee to approve the recommendation by the CAO and transfer funds for We Create LA and the Youth Creative Works mural program to the Department of Cultural Affairs to begin programming. We support both programs in their initial design as managed and administered by the DCA. We understand the significant and positive impact that both programs will have in the city as they place critical resources in communities and address social justice through the arts. We ask that through this vote, you continue to demonstrate your commitment to the arts, social justice, economic development, and equity in LA. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Gina Viola, and I'm making general public comment. Okay, one minute. Go right ahead. 
I am a member of White People for Black Lives, which is part of the People's Budget Coalition, furthering um, early commenters about agendizing the Bonham motion. Your inaction is going to cost more civilian lives. A few weeks ago, Chief Moore stated during a police commission meeting that the current Academy of Cadets did not have a COVID vaccine mandate. Thanks to your refusal to agendize the bond in motion, no new cops motion, we will now have even more unvaccinated police running around our city. I am furthering BLMLA's demands that this motion be agendized at once. And why is this meeting audio only? Kids are back in school. It is time that we, re- we go back to meeting in person. It is impossible for us to meaningfully comment on things before you've even discussed them. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Thank you. It's Eric Previn, and I'd like to speak on the items, and I'll give a, a small general public comment as well. If that's, okay. Uh, if that's okay. Of course. Two minutes on the item and one minute for general public comment. Uh, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the outside council um, costs, which is one of your items today. Um, I'm concerned about a number of things. One, I know that uh, Council Member Krikorian was raising concerns about redistricting. Well, here we're paying 55000 to Olson Remcho for assistance with redistricting in the Voting Rights Act. I just... I find it odd that the payment is coming through now when, you know, it's all hitting its frenzy. It's very strange. And who, I guess, is it Nick Warshaw who's been working for us? Very, very strange. Now, I want to bring to the attention of uh, De Leon, who finally showed up. Thank you, sir. That, uh, you know, escheatment of money is a meaningful. And we're taking 585. And I hats off to uh, Diana Mangioglu, who's the new... Office of Finance maestro for jolting those numbers higher now. I don't know that she had anything to do with it, but we usually see around 390000 a year. We're up to $580,000 in this cheated money. This means money that is taken out of the pockets of people who've been arrested and never returned because of the labyrinthian old world system that's run by the Daily Journal guy, Charlie Munger of Harvard West. He just got a great boon because they have made other kinds of payouts be post. You have to post a notice in his publications, and it becomes law. So what a business plan that is. Boy, those guys like Warren Buffett, they make they make a lot of money, but I don't think that $585,000 out of the pockets of the poorest and most desperate Angelinos is a nice way to go. So maybe peek into that. Where does all the money go? Well, Danny Bakewell and the LA Times, because that's where we buy the ads and Daily Journal. So lovely. In terms of the outside council costs, you know, when you say that Sanders Roberts is getting another 25000 we say thank you. But we wonder why didn't you mention that they also took one million three hundred and fifty-seven thousand? These these are not labeled properly, and it's nice to see that there's another eighty-four thousand uptick for Myers Mabe, the Treasury partners who are helping out in the you know out in the uh, land of CD twelve or CD three, where they're trying the Santa Susana story. So your cool two minutes for the for the items has expired. You have one minute for general public comment. Fine, Amrit. Cool commie who works at Myers Name. This guy, I mean, Jesus, these guys make a lot of money, okay? And they have a favored nations clause that nobody uh, makes more than they do, or they're out. We spent six hundred and eighty-four thousand. I mean, and then Kerkorian and Mr. Fuhr have got Kaplan, Kirsch, and Rockwell, and Corrett's in a little sidecar trying to fight the FAA. I mean, you know, it's one thing to say it's a hundred thousand dollars. We're going to take care of it and hire this firm. We're up to eight hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars. I mean, Blumen, where's Blumenfield? Can he blow his stack today? Or that was just yesterday at the PACER program. I think we need to get real fiscal restraint and scrutiny. And I, I really would like to raise almost like a red flag uh, with a little uh, something popping out of the red flag. Thank you. Uh, yesterday's Thank you. run Next. by Rahman. Thank you. Real Next speaker, problem. please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Uh, just public comment. Uh, my name is Bambi Salcedo. Good afternoon. Which item would uh, you like to speak on? 
I'm making a public comment, please. Okay, go right ahead. One minute. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to address you. My name is Bambi Salcedo, and I am part of the Trans Latino Coalition, and I'm calling on behalf of people of Spachet LA and Black Lives Matter LA. And I am calling specifically to ask um, Chair Kokorian to make sure to agendize the motion of no new cups. Um, obviously, you know, this is an important issue for all peoples because it will provide much needed resources for our community rather than continuing to invest in a corrupt um, police department. So please make sure that you do put this item in the agenda so that there can be discussion and hopefully uh, pass this new piece of uh, legislation. So um, please do what the people says that you should do. You're a public servant and you should do that for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. It's Ghost Puppet, world famous food critic. All items, general public comment. You have two minutes on the agenda items. Stick with the agenda yeah. items and then one minute. For my favorite public. Armenian. Yeah. You're already off topic. No, so stick to the agenda. I don't know. Sorry, Armenian. Number 20, first fiscal status report. <laughs> Pay Mark Ridley Thomas's salary. Number 19, fuck number 19. Number 18, make law. What the fuck is that? I don't know. Fuck at that. Number 17, the fire department. Yes. Yes, on number 17. And don't force them to be vaccinated. Because we don't have enough firemen already. Okay, Monica? Yes, Master. Number 16. Reapportionment of the funds for the city. Where's my clock? <laughs> no. Number 15. Report for the stars of community. Avenue of the stars, community amenities. Fuck the avenue of the stars. No. Number 14. Volunteer trust fund. No such thing. Everything you do is by force. Number 13, the money that were seized, $585,000. Go puppet moves to give it to the USC School of Public Works. I suck it. Yeah, a good cause. Item number 12, the board review of the housing community. They don't do anything fuck that. Number 11. The first construction project, non-existent garbage, fuck that. And then nine and ten. Yes, the COVID money, we keep stealing it. It keeps going and going like the Energizer Bunny. But we have a problem with the COVID money. We're not spending enough of it. Pay MRT a salary. Now my general comment. There was an article. <laughs> About a certain Armenian. <laughs> Do you sold your house without building permits. Is that right? Why did Paul Martin Krikorian not pull all his building permits, according to Mayor Sam? And still he sits there, looking up at the ceiling right now, going, Why? Why do I have to sit here in this city? Why can't I be like MRT and retire early? <laughs> and finally... To the 11 of you who voted to suspend a man who has not been tried yet, we have a message from CD10. It reads as follows. Fuck each and every one of you. <laughs> so remember, you're innocent until proven guilty. Fuck USC. Fuck the city charter. And fuck the controller for not paying a man for his your Next speaker, is... please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Lionel Mares from City 6. I'm speaking on behalf of the voiceless people of the East San Fernando Valley. And, I would like to I'm make sorry. general public comment. All right, yes, go right ahead, sir. You have one, one minute for general public yes. comment. Go right ahead. Okay. 
Um, I read Council Member Nasia Rahman's um, motion to divert certain funds from the LAPD department, I believe, and it's um, trial and error method, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. When he took office during the Great Depression, he um, pushed legislation to help revive the U.S. economy, right? Like the NRA and other programs. I believe that you could do something similar at the local level. We could increase funding for other social services to help people with their needs, economic needs, to divert them from a life of crime, psychosis, mental health services. We should try something like what FDR did when he was president. And I believe they should try it. Um, we should create different programs, increase funding, management, and to prevent mismanagement of funds from other departments who are misusing our funds and just use those funds to help the people who are in need, especially the underprivileged people living within the San Fernando Valley and the city of L.A. Um, because I, I'll keep hearing it. Your time has expired. Thank you very much, sir. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller, are you there? 5436? Yeah, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, which items would you like Sorry. to speak on? 19 in general public comment, please. All right, one minute on the item and one minute for general public comment. Go right ahead. Okay, so yeah, you're getting ready to spend millions of dollars producing and posting 4118 signs. I think that money could be a lot better spent actually providing housing and services and housing vouchers to unhoused people. Uh, but if you're insistent on uh, using this money on printing up signage, why don't you print up signs of the federal statutes prohibiting taking bribes and post those in uh, City Hall and in the council offices? Because obviously <laughs> the City Council has a really hard time remembering not to take bribes. Uh, three of you have been indicted in the last three years. Um, and when you people get indicted, it's a much bigger problem for the city than an unhoused person trying to survive on the street. Just like CD10 no longer has representation, CD12 didn't have representation, CD14 didn't have representation, and all the contracts that the, the indicted CMs voted on were called into question. So I think the money would be better spent on services for people, but if you're going to do signs, let's do some anti-bribery signs in City Hall. You have Moving one on to general for general public comment. Yeah, I'd like to echo the commenters who um, have rightly pointed out that uh, Chairman Krikorian has not agendized the no new cops motion. Um, when he voted to uh, prohibit protests in front of council members' homes, he did so by saying there was plenty of opportunity to, to speak to council members, uh, except you've gotten over 150 emails, Paul, plus many calls from people and public comments asking you to agendize this and you ignore them. Now, I realize that none of these people were a billionaire, you know, DreamWorks guy from uh, Malibu or whatever, but we've been asking for it and you're ignoring us, Paul. So that's why people were showing up at your house because you don't listen. Agendize the motion. You've agendized every other budget amendment, basically, that was made except this one. Agendize the motion. Those that those funds, that eighteen million dollars, could be used much better for non-armed uh, emergency response. And as as others have said, that's what we need. We don't need more. Your time has expired, and um, Councilmember Corcoran, that uh, ends our public comment. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all who called in. Um, so. Members, as uh, I mentioned before, we have a number of consent items, and <clears throat> I'm just going to read the recommendations again. Let me know if any of these uh, are uh, items that you'd like to call special. Item 7 and 8, uh, the recommendation is to approve the city attorney's recommendations. Item 11, the recommendation is to concur with the ITGS committee recommendations to approve the CAO's recommendations as amended. Item 12, 
to approve the Collections Board of Review recommendations. Item 13, to approve the Office of Finance recommendations, uh, a recommendation to us cheat uh, the amount stated to the general fund. Item 14, to note and file. Item 15, to note and file. Item 16, to concur in the Plum Committee recommendation to approve the motion. Item 17, to approve the motion. And item 18, to approve the CAO's recommendations. Members, are there any of those items that uh, anyone would like to call special? Seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and call the roll on the consent recommendations, please. Councilmember Kukorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Councilmember. Blumenfield, Tim. aye. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Price. Aye. Five ayes. The items are approved as stated by the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and now let's go uh, back to item number nine. Was there any other discussion or uh, questions or consideration of item number nine? Uh, seeing none, uh, the committee will note and file that item. Uh, do we need to call the roll and note and file? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, go right ahead. Councilmember Kukorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? Aye. Councilmember De Leon? Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Price? Aye. Five ayes. The item is noted and filed. All right. Uh, so that will bring us next uh, to consideration of our open session items. And we'll begin with the FSR item number 20. And uh, uh, let's go ahead and hear first from the CAO. And then as is our custom members, I'd like to ask that you call particular de department special if you want to ask department specific questions uh, so that we can release everyone else who's in the meeting uh, who, who is not subject to those questions. So uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Uh, yes, I have fire and personnel, please. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and, and actually do that now then before the CAO speaks. So fire, personnel, uh, Mr. Blumenfield. As, uh, personnel, as already stated, I have an amendment as well. Uh, uh, it's a narrow one, but I can do that later. Okay. Uh, Mr. Price, any departments to call special? Uh, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. De Leon? Any departments you'd like to call special? Seeing none. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez, for starting us off with efficiency. So fire and personnel, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to stick around. And everyone else, uh, thank you very much for being a part of our meeting. Uh, you can go for now, subject to being recalled if we come up with uh, questions on the fly. But uh, thank you all very much. Uh, all right. Um, let's go ahead and turn it over then to our CAO, Mr. Zabo is here. Mr. Zabo, will you be presenting or will Mr. Poon? I will be uh, presenting uh, introductory uh, remarks and then uh, Mr. Poon will provide more detail and, and be able to answer your questions. Should you thank have. you. Very okay. good. Go right ahead. Very good. Well, well thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here to present the first financial status report uh, for fiscal year 21-22. Based on our review of our revenues, our expenditures, and the city's uh, reserves to date, uh, I can report today that the city is regaining its financial footing from the depths of the pandemic's economic downturn. Uh, as it relates to revenues, uh, the budget assumed that the city's economically sensitive revenues would begin to recover this year and certainly early evidence uh, is supporting those assumptions. We are, uh, as of today, $97 million above plan. Uh, it includes uh, $22 million ahead of where we should be today on sales tax, uh, nearly $10 million ahead of where we should be on transit, uh, transient occupancy tax, and $6.4 million ahead on business tax. But it is uh, premature uh, to predict where our final revenues will end up uh, as today's report only represents 12% of the budgeted revenue to date. 
Uh, we do continue to face risk uh, in the area of property tax, um, which although uh, property tax is currently 9.2 million ahead of plan, uh, the budget does assume, uh, the adopted budget assumes a 6% valuation growth, uh, while the county assessor is forecasting uh, only 4%. Uh, on the expenditure side, um, the report identifies uh, nearly $100 million in projected overspending by departments, including $53 million in the police department and $19 million in the fire department. But we believe that this overspending is well within the manageable range, uh, in large part because some of the solutions uh, are available uh, in the unappropriated balance, uh, particularly for police, and, as um, are consistent with the report's recommendations. Uh, the $100 million overspend, projected overspend, also includes additional costs uh, for the human resources and payroll project, uh, as well as a COVID vaccination and, and reporting, which we will address uh, in a future report uh, solutions for those uh, potential additional costs. Uh, as it relates to our reserves, uh, our combined general fund reserves are in very good health uh, due to higher than anticipated revenues and reversions from fiscal year 2021. Our combined reserves stand today at $785 million. That represents 10.46% of general fund revenue. Our reserve fund is at $652 million. That's 8.7%. Our budget stabilization fund at $118 million. That's 1.58%. Um, and although uh, these are record levels of reserves, uh, this office strongly recommends maintaining these levels uh, given the risks in the current and upcoming years. Um, our, in fact, our, our reserve position uh, and the city's commitment to build and protect its reserve position was repeatedly cited by bond rating agencies when they recently issued their uh, strong ratings reports and stable outlooks for our general obligation bonds uh, and also cited our reserves uh, as um, an area where they would consider potential upgrades. Um, in addition to that, 10.46% uh, uh, does seem very healthy, and it is very healthy, um, but I do want to remind the committee that 10% is our policy target in our financial policies. Uh, we still have an unknown uh, set of COVID expenditures uh, as we move forward from, uh, from testing to vaccination. Uh, and uh, return to work eventually. We, we certainly, as you know, have um, uh, an un uncertain uh, labor costs. All of the um, uh, deferrals that were made, and this budget, I uh, do want to remind you, was is benefiting from uh, more than $150 million in deferrals that all of our labor partners made. Um, all of uh, the contracts do have reopeners. Uh, and if we, as we execute and consider additional uh, requests from labor, that will, of course, have uh, potential costs. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have a very high level of one-time spending on new one-time programs in this budget. And although they are uh, stated as one-time programs, to the extent that there is interest in continuing any of the programs that were established with one-time dollars, uh, it will be very important that we have uh, financial flexibility that the uh, high level of reserves uh, give us. I also want to um, just very quickly uh, note that um, in this FSR, we are presenting uh, an updated budget outlook, uh, which projects a future year budget gaps for the next three years, uh, and then a surplus in fiscal 25-26. Uh, so what we are looking at is $260 million uh, 261 million for 22-23 as a budget deficit, uh, projected deficit, 135 million for 23-24, 47 million in 24-25, and then a surplus of 157 million in 25-26. Uh, the adjustment is in um, in part due to uh, the additional ongoing costs as we continue to restore services and add positions. Uh, we will we do need to build into our uh, to our outlook, the ongoing costs of salaries and, and pension obligations. Um, I do want to uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Wilson Poon, um, but before I do, and as I do, I do want to uh, recognize Wilson for his great work um, 
here at the CAO. He has been the uh, quarterback of the financial status reports for the past two years, uh, including uh, all, preparing all of the uh, pandemic FSRs uh, um, with uh, incredible even-handedness, um, and he did a tremendous job in the most trying of times. Um, we are losing Wilson to the Bureau of Sanitation after 16 years uh, at the CAO. This will be his last FSR. So I do just want to, uh, again, thank Wilson and uh, turn the table over to him if I could um, for uh, some additional detail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Zabo. And uh, thank you uh, for your recognition of, of Wilson too. Um, if ever there was a, a time when presenting FSRs was uh, a pleasant task, this was certainly not it. So the, the last couple of years uh, that Wilson has had that challenge has been unprecedented. And so we all want to thank you uh, very much, Wilson, for your work uh, and wish you all the best in your, in your next position. Uh, and I'm glad that you're able to, to wrap it up with a pretty strong FSR that almost seems like uh, we're back to normal times, almost. Um, so why don't we, uh, before you begin though, Wilson, let me just, uh, I, I did want to reiterate a couple of the points that Mr. Zabo pointed out. One is on the, on the strength of the reserve. Um, very good news. But let's also remember that we had record reserves two years ago as well. And uh, had we not had those record reserves, um, this city would have faced massive and immediate layoffs of, um, of em employees across the board. And so, um, yes, it's good news that we have a healthy reserve, but I don't think anybody should pop any champagne corks just yet uh, as long as we are facing the instability that we continue to face. Um, uh, and the same goes for the long-term uh, outlook. It's nice to see um, budget surplus at some point in the future. But of course, that uh, is before assuming increases in payroll and other things that, that we know is likely a reality. So um, it's good news, but it's not um, something I think that we should get carried away with uh, at this point. So uh, with that, Mr. Poon, go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Councilman uh, Wilson Puma, the CAO. I, I really don't have much more to add than what uh, Matt had said. I think I'll just throw in that um, for our departmental budgets, uh, most departments were reporting um, to finish year within budget. Um, some departments had some surpluses, um, which is a great news. Um, we also, in the um, department narratives, identified some issues of concern that may potentially impact those departments. So I just kind of wanted to quickly highlight some of those issues. Um, for the aging department, we had a discussion on the expansion of the uh, senior meals program. Um, for building and safety, we had a uh, short discussion on the revenue shortfalls in the repair and demolition fund, which we recommend a reserve fund loan. Uh, for sanitation, we have, um, we have yet to determine the fiscal impacts of the Hyperion spill. Um, and we also have a brief discussion also on the need, on the need for a rate increase for both uh, SWERF and SEM. Um, let me see, for street lighting, we also discussed some unbudgeted costs for the copper wire theft program. Um, we're going to continue to work with the, the Bureau to identify solutions for that. Um, and then for the zoo, lastly, we have a short discussion on additional revenues from the zoo lights events from federal grants and some higher than anticipated attendance during the summer and spring, which we think could help us close the um, revenues on the department special funds. So. Um, those are just some of those um, issues we wanted to highlight in the departmental budgets, but I think everything that I was going to discuss, Matt had covered uh, with a fine comb, so a uh, fine tooth comb there, so. Very good. Uh, well, thank you again very much. Thank you for your service to the CAO's office uh, and to this committee. We appreciate it very much. Um, members, questions for the CAO? Ms. Rodriguez? Yes, thank you. and. Uh... Congratulations, Wilson, I think, um, but, uh, <laughs> but thank you for your service uh, in the CAO's office. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, Matt, I, you know, and I, I just wanted to have a question. I had a couple of questions and I'll be uh, kind of broad about it, but there were several expenditures that were proposed uh, unanticipated with respect to 
uh, using our reserves for programming or projects that could be identified uh, through the, uh, you know, different infrastructure projects that were proposed as a result of uh, the federal spending plan, the, you know, uh, Build Back Better and a number of infrastructure programs. Um, I mean, given, given kind of where things stand right now, I mean, and uh, some of those proposals, I guess my question is, is, you know, given what the state has offered, are there any uh, resources that we could potentially reprogram back to the reserve to strengthen it, given uh, what our current outlook is? Uh, we are um, working on a on a report um, that addresses just that uh, currently. Um, Wilson, or I don't know if Ben is on the call right now. I don't know if, there, if there's anything that we could say at this point, but we are we are working on um, looking at all of those all of those availabilities, uh, and we'll report back with those recommendations. Um, does any other staff have anything to else that they could add to that? Hi, good afternoon. This is Ben Sahel with the CEO. I, I, as uh, Matt stated, uh, that is something that, that we'll be looking into. We'll be looking into projects and seeing what if any, uh, federal state funding may be available for us to, to bring in and, and potentially uh, swap out some general fund. There's always issues with that because you know sometimes those dollars come with supplantation issues. So to the extent that we have gaps in projects that haven't been identified as a, you know, there isn't a funding source identified, you know, that would be uh, prime candidates to bring in state and federal dollars, but that doesn't necessarily help on, on the, with the question you have about freeing up funds and then go back to the reserve fund. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, it's almost a case by case issue with, with projects to see what, what makes the most sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I know what's on the forefront of all of our minds and we talk about the reserve fund being for that you know, unanticipated uh, circumstance. And, you know, we've just lived through that un uh, unanticipated circumstance where we've, you know, bled ourselves out uh, with public safety resources and a variety of other areas uh, that, you know, looking ahead, it's just one of those things that I think I'm, you know, uh, even more gun shy uh, on this, uh, you know, in how we, how we commit our resources in a manner that doesn't really even further strengthen us given what we just lived through uh and thankfully uh avoided a lot of uh you know the fact that we're already kind of recovering from it is is uh we don't know that we will always have the federal government there to to help us out in that way and so i'm just sensitive to that yeah, I, I do want to state that, you know, as, as Matt say, we just went through a, a review process with rating agencies, four rating agencies. And, and one of the things that, in, in addition to having a strong reserve that they have uh, noted um, to us is the fact that we're, you know, complying with our investment policy on capital projects, capital and technology projects. As you know, we recently did a revision to our capital uh, and technology improvement pro um, policy where uh, the percent has, has been increased. And the fact that we're achieving that percent is, is, a, is a good point in, in these reviews because that means we're making the investments into our infrastructure. So, so that is something that uh, is also positive, not just keeping money in the reserves for future downturns, but also making investments in capital infrastructure. Thank you. And, and given some of the, uh, you know, I know there were, there are several departments where we're still uh, you know, we haven't necessarily restored staffing levels, and that's where perhaps a lot of the salary savings and uh, a lot of our savings are. Um, how might those dollars, uh, or how have you guys done a review basically to see, uh, given that we know we've kind of built in future deficits based on some of the uh, overtime, uh, you know, we kind of kicked the can down the road with uh, some of the overtime expenditures that. Uh, we had associated with police, for example, um, how might we kind of devise a, an opportunity to pay that off sooner to save ourselves uh, from those future deficits? So, so the way we, we typically work is, is we're, we're just, we're tracking those potential surpluses in, in departments and uh, hopefully they'll stay surpluses uh, towards the end. Um, you know, uh, even, even if they just come within budget, that's, that's a positive on our, on, as we, you know, we, we look at it. 
uh, whether they, they spent to their budget is a positive and whether and if they have a surplus, that's a positive. What happens is we'll use those surpluses for any citywide issues that we may have uh, so that, you know, everybody that has a surplus is contributing to the citywide solutions. Um, and, and to the extent that we're able to solve those citywide solutions, then whatever is left remaining gets swept into the reserve fund um, to be used um, either in, as part of next year's budget or to be to stay within the reserve funds. So that's how we typically manage this, and, and you'll see those um, kind of how we're doing it in this in future subsequent FSRs. And so, will you guys provide then potentially the suggestion? I mean, if we could reduce what we've built in in terms of future deficits reductions based on some of those uh, savings. Future deficits related to the budget outlook. That we were based on, yeah, right. Because based, I know what we did with, uh, for example, with uh, overtime. You know, we have uh, we haven't paid out a lot of overtime. We're still bank. It's all it was banked. So, given that, for example. Well, I, I think uh, what will happen is in the mayor's proposed budget, you'll see kind of the first glimpse of of how we're how that future budget outlooks. Um, uh, is uh, how we're shaping up uh, what future budget out outlooks with the mayor's proposed budget that gets released in April. Um, in, in that proposal, if, if we're still showing surpluses, if we're still showing reserve funds, then you know the mayor, mayor's office, mayor, mayor C may may want to invest in in bringing down overtime by by providing more cash overtime for departments. Um, but that typically would be something that you know we wouldn't really be looking at until the mayor proposes his budget for, for the following year. Right? We're, we're, we're typically paying that out at retirement. And uh, the best thing we can do to, to reduce our ongoing overtime liability to, on the overtime banks is by not adding to it year, year over year. And, and that's why uh, you'll have, you know, our office will recommend uh, budgeting to what we think we're going to we're going to actually spend and and not trying to reduce dollars um, certainly in LAPD or LAFD budget um, in the overtime if we're just going to to bank in, in LAPD's case if we're going to if we're going to bank it because it doesn't make any sense so in, in, a, in a certain sense paying more now is going to save us mo save money in the long term right okay thank you Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. So we're building on the themes that, that uh, Ms. Rodriguez was mentioning, just in terms of the overtime last discussion, uh, the other piece is obviously, we all know it makes sense if we can pay that down to do it um, because it's a, it's a high interest credit card essentially, but the, you know, potentially FEMA reimbursement coming in for some of the, you know, we had a lot of costs. Is that going to be a way that we're going to get this, Overtime paid down. Indirectly, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ben. I was going to say overtime is is one of the uh, allowable ex expenses that we're, we're able to get reimbursed from FEMA. Um, uh, but uh, to, to the extent that we've already established a, a, a bank, like uh, there's, it, it's hard to pay off the bank without actual agreement from individuals that you know have that bank in place i don't understand that, oh. that that's that's what i meant by indirectly that they we the the five million dollars is available for members to cash out their bank it's it's at the member's discretion uh we would have to negotiate a forced buy down if that's what we wanted to do um, and and so again, the 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 main way the bank is reduced is when we pay it out at, at retirement. So indirectly, when we get reimbursed for uh, overtime, that will go into our general fund, and then we're using that general fund for the payouts. Right, but if we if we if we had a chunk of money for for that, and we just stop banking overtime and we start paying overtime, we would draw that down. We would definitely draw that down over time. Yes. That's the but goal. That, that's where I'm hoping if we get a big chunk of money and we can set it aside for, for bringing us down on the, uh, on the overtime credit card. Um, 
But anyway, I didn't, I didn't, that was a little bit of a diversion from this FSR, but it was coming up and so I brought it in. Uh, another question though, you know, we talked about the, the surpluses in different departments and this is why I wanted personnel up there, but it, it, yes, it's a good thing because it's providing a little extra funding, but it's also a big red flashing warning light because that means we're not hiring, we're not doing the services that people are expecting. Uh, and, in, and in the case of revenue generating uh, departments, we're not collecting that revenue. So uh, what kind of analysis are we doing to, to address that big flashing red light in terms of this, this is not necessarily a positive thing that, that, we're, that departments are showing a surplus. It's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a warning sign. Well, I, I think there's actually, there is some positive to it in that the, it, as, as you budgeted for the, first, for the fiscal year, you actually provided the departments with the appropriate level of funding needed to hire against the positions you authorized. So that is a positive in that departments weren't told, oh, you have to manage, you know, uh, with, with short, you know, sh shaved off salary accounts or furloughs that, that never came to be. You, you, you provided the appropriate level of funding for the positions but I think um, probably um, only personnel could, could have anticipated because they're the ones that have to deal with it. The, the, the challenges with, with hiring uh, that we're, you know, every department I think is, is facing, including the CAO. You know, we, we have a number of vacancies we can't fill and, and uh, you know, it, it's, it is a challenge. And I see Wendy is, is probably better able to speak on that now. Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll, I know we call personnel as a department and that, that's probably the topic on all of our minds, but I just was, since you guys were up now, we're getting you a chance to weigh in on that too, because if if the juggernaut is that we can't, you know, or, or the, the backlog is that we can't hire people fast enough, that's, a, that's an issue. Would you like to hear from personnel now or would you like to wait until the department is called? leave that to the chair's discretion. I, I think as long as the topic has been raised and we only have two departments, uh, you can go right ahead and respond to that. Please, Ms. Macy. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Uh, Wendy Macy from the personnel department. Um, you know, we're very appreciative of all the efforts that the committee has made uh, to support the personnel department. Um, you know, and obviously a very tumultuous time for our city. Um, you know, as just to set the stage, you may recall that uh, there was the separation incentive program personnel department was very hard hit by that. Uh, we lost approximately 62 positions, including very high level positions. We're very grateful for the committee to restoring uh, 18 of those positions, which we've just now gotten approval from council, of course, with only six months uh, funding and allocation. So our hope is to get those positions on board. Uh, we would have hoped to have gotten them on sooner to get ahead of the hiring curve. Um, at the same time, we're projecting demands from departments in terms of hiring has increased by about 25%. So again, while personnel department, uh, you know, lost 10% of its staff and our, our demands have increased by 25%, um, obviously the trajectory is not going in the right direction. So we are working with the mayor's office um, on an interim uh, budget request, which actually is a, a very substantial request. Uh, for personnel to see where we can get so that we do not let this uh, this hole or this gap become even wider um, because we recognize what happened in the, in the previous recession. Um, also, of course, personnel is very, very intimately involved in a lot of the activities related to COVID, uh, the vaccine issues and so forth. And so a lot of our uh, efforts are in those directions. Um, and then there are also actually a couple of uh, macro trends that we're seeing that are impacting hiring. Um, we are seeing that we're getting fewer candidates in some of our large scale exams than we had in the past. Uh, this is part of sort of what we're seeing in terms of the labor market overall of uh, people are, you know, leaving jobs, finding new jobs, there's many more opportunities. Um, and we're also seeing that in our selection processes where people are actually, you know, turning down jobs or job offers at the last minute, um, forcing people to go through a process again and again. So those are the general factors. Um, which are leading to uh, our, you know, uh, extreme disappointment at not being able to make meet everyone's hiring demands. But again, demands have actually increased quite a bit. Uh, we're short staffed and we're really working with the mayor's office to, again, to try to uh, get staffed up so that we can, uh, you know, meet our clients needs.
Anything else, Mr. Bloomerfield? No. Thank you. Uh, members, anything else for the CAO or for personnel, as long as we have it? Ms. Rodriguez, did you want to follow up with personnel as well? Yeah, I mean, I and, and thank you, Wendy, and, and that's helpful. I mean, I know, listen, even just everyone, and God help Matt Zabo, I know you guys have, everyone's got vacancies that we're all trying to fill, and, you know, and then you've got Wilson leaving for sanitation. Uh, so, you know, we trying to backfill the talent is, is uh, obviously a, a big challenge for everybody. Um, that being said, and, and recognizing the hit that you've taken, uh, what opportunities, even for background searches, and I know for a number of our departments, that's critical. Uh, have, have you looked at even uh, expanding that capacity by contract services to accelerate that so that we could actually have greater vetting and uh, through that process? What types of uh, other assistance could be deployed or that you, have you looked at? in order to just help get our staffs back up to capacity. Because I know with sanitation, you know, look, every department you look at, EWDD, all the vacancies, uh, I, you know, a lot of it, it will get bottlenecked based on just even the, the amount of work that it takes to process uh, a lot of these candidates. So uh, what's been the effort in that, in that arena? Yeah, and I, I'll answer this, but also I think RM Kiyumjin's here too, so he can provide additional detail. But in the public safety, um, specifically, we lost an entire team of background investigators of, of, of five people. So we are getting that restored again, thanks so much to your committee. We're asking for an additional two teams of background investigators. Of course, it will take a little bit of time for them to get up and running. Um, and then, uh, we, you know, I think if we uh, could invest in some uh, overtime as needed, that would be that have the most immediate impact to be able to get uh, these background investigations done more timely. We we're also talking to LAPD. They're, of course, willing to help us. Um, we're working on that. But you're correct. I mean, background investigations and then also medical services are some things that impact the hiring process, which sometimes um, doesn't get as much focus. But as you can imagine, medical services has been you know, up to the gills in, in dealing with the pandemic. So those are two areas I think that are um, I'll let Aram chime in if he has anything else to add. Uh, I think the one thing is that when you mentioned how a department demand has increased by 25%, well, in LAPD's case, that's approximately 50% over what we used to hire uh, pre-COVID. And on top of that, uh, not only have we uh, lost uh, a cadre of background investigators, uh, which were just now restored almost uh, a, a third of the way into the fiscal year. We, we are also dealing with lower amounts in recruitment funding compared to pre-COVID times. Um, there have been no additional uh, resources given even despite the um, increased hiring needs for either exam analysts or, or any uh, medical staffers. So recruitment funds would be very helpful. Um, as as uh, Wendy mentioned, it, over time and as needed funds would have the most immediate impact. As far as farming out the work with um, with police and fire, given the um, care that we have to administer, given the events of the past um, year and the lessons of the past year or two, uh, we don't like farming those out to outside vendors. We do have outside vendors for quasi sworn positions, uh, such as detention officer and, and things like that. And those are available to us uh, and we can utilize them, but, but those also come with limited funding as well. Okay, thank you. And um, the only other question I had just uh, with respect to uh, some of the expenditures associated, I'm trying to remember, I think it's on PACER. And yeah, what what's the status of uh, all the work that's on the PACER program and uh, and the delays associated with that? Sure, um, and, and and actually there there's there's a separate report specific to the human uh, human resources uh, payroll project that will be making its way to this committee that provides a, a lot more specific detail than it's in the FSR relative to to. Um, the project, the delays, and the potential solutions for uh, managing that project and the go live of that project. But but just to, to provide a quick summary of it, 
there were there have been delays related to the project. The project was slated to go live um, at the end of this calendar year, so uh, go, going live in January 2022. 20, uh, but uh, again, due to a number of factors, specifically the the inability of staff to be working together in in close proximity on on the testing of this of the modules uh, for this new system, the, and also some of the vacancies created uh, because of the SIP program. Um, there have been delays that are now um, uh, making it so that in order for this project to be successful, we need to be looking at a phased approach that uh, will take uh, the majority of the next calendar year. Uh, different modules coming on board at different points next calendar year, um, maybe as early as April for some. But, but for payroll itself coming on board at the end of 2022. And I, I believe uh, um, knowing a little bit about the project, that's the best option for success for this very important critical system. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it is. I'm, as I recall, we're about a heartbeat away on that. Um, so I know it's something that we want to, but I guess, you know, looking at what some of the impacts have been, uh, what are the implications for some of the other uh, technology migrations that we're doing, you know, that ITA is proposing? And I, and the reason why I say this is because I know there's just a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of systems changes that we need to, uh, to deal with in the city. And so I'm just concerned with the delays and such. This is such, this is obviously one of the more critical ones, but we had conversations uh even just with the uh, Office of Finance uh, through the budget process last year and making sure that, you know, there are lessons learned in this because we got, we can't, you know, time is money and all of these delays are clearly critical to our, uh, you know, our functions here in the city. So this is obviously one of the biggest ones. But, that, uh, that's, that's correct. And, and just to add, uh, add a couple points here, the first is that the, the uh, newly approved uh, capital and technology uh, improvement um, policy speaks to a five-year plan that will incorporate technology, large system technology upgrades as part of that five-year plan, in, in addition to our what would normally considered like the brick and mortar capital uh, projects. So we, we will be tracking, you know, big technology uh, citywide projects uh, as part of this plan. And, and the oversight of this plan uh, will fall under the Information Technology Oversight Committee and then flow through that committee to either ITGS or any other com council committee for review and uh, of project status and updates. So um, with the approval of the, of the uh, policy that, that was uh, recently updated, I think we'll have a, a better gauge of, of where some of these projects stand moving forward against what's been budgeted, what's been approved and what's been designed. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Members, anything else for personnel? Anything else for the CIO? All right. Uh, well, again, Mr. Poon, thank you very much uh, for all of your service, and we wish you all the best uh, as you move to your next position. Hope, hope we'll probably see you back here, actually, from time to time. So look forward to seeing you in your new capacity. All right. Uh, that will take us next to the fire department. And we'll start that discussion with our public safety chair, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. And who do we have? Uh, good afternoon, Emilio Rodriguez with the uh, Fire Department's Administrative Services Bureau. Thank you. So, you know, I, I recognize that there's a there's the projected overspending uh, associated with the budget. And I just wanted to for mutual aid and what are what is kind of the percentages associated with mutual aid firefighting services versus some of these other uh, expenditures? Uh, right. So just to put the uh, net deficit of 14 million that's reported in the FSR in context. Uh, about 10 million of that could be attributed to items that we are not entirely budgeted for, but are reimbursable. So that would include uh, 6 million in mutual aid reimbursements that we typically receive every year. And that's at the bottom scale. Last year, we got uh, close to 12 million in 
Mitchell Lake due to the you know, ongoing wildfires throughout the, the state and region. Um, Three million in COVID overtime that's been incurred since July 1st over the first quarter. Uh, and that would be reimbursable through FEMA public assistance. We report those expenditures regularly to the CAO's office. And another million or so in uh, fireboat maintenance. That's a large item, a significant item that we're not budgeted for, but uh, that we do make adjustments for through the FSR process and ultimately get reimbursed from uh, the Harbor Department. Um, so we've already seen some reimbursements from Harbor on July 1st. I'm, antici uh, I'm anticipating at least 1 million through year end minimum. So that accounts for about 10 million of the 14 million. And we, uh, there are, to balance the rest of the budget, there are, there was funding put into the UB for salary content, contingencies for fire. Uh, at this point, you know, when you consider reimbursements, we're in a positive shape on the budget to uh, sort of clear a deficit. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield, did you also have questions for fire? No, I'm good. Okay, uh, Mr. Price, Mr. DeLeon, anything for fire? All right, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Um, is there anything else, members on the FSR? Mr. Blumenfield, you had indicated that you had an amendment to propose? I, I do. Um, Specifically, uh, to authorize the appropriation and transfer of $212,353.75 from the Public Works Trust Fund, fund number 834, Department 50, RSC 5742-02, to the ventura Coenga Corridor Plan Fund, fund number 523, Department 94, appropriation account 94TM14, for street improvement work in Council District 3 related to the reimagined Ventura Boulevard street improvement projects. Um, and just to be clear, these, these are funds that are development fees that are restricted to the third district. And it's just about putting them uh, toward the reimagined Ventura Boulevard project specifically. They're not citywide funds, they're district funds. That's it. Are you frozen, Mr. Kokori? Or just not very animated? <laughs> I think he's frozen. I think the chair is frozen. We'll give him a minute to come back. I think I think your words were so powerful, Mr. Blumenfeld, that uh, you fossilized up. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, Mr. Chair is frozen. He's come out of the meeting. We'll come back in as, as the, the vice chair. I'll take over the meeting briefly, but we'll give him a second to, uh, to come I'll, back. Uh, and, what's that? Are you sure that's all you want to give, uh, Bob? You don't want to give yeah. a little more? Well, it's just coming out of the third district funds anyway. So otherwise, I'd, I'd bump it up to uh, 100 million. No. Uh, We, I'm assuming that our chair is going to jump back in in a second. Mr. Blumenfeld, I would suggest if you have any major budgetary uh, proposals or votes that, that you'd like to take, this is the opportunity. Seize the moment. do that to our chair, but uh, did we just lose Monica too? Now we're down to a bare quorum. My apologies. My apologies, members. Battery failure. <laughs> so, um, should be good to go now. <laughs> 
but I thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. I got your amendment, and if there is uh, no objection, the FSR uh, will be considered so amended. Um, I also wanted to suggest a couple of uh, small things. Um, first, uh, there are a couple of instructions in there uh, regarding the Department of Cultural Affairs, um, specifically the Youth and Creative Workers Mural and, uh, Program and the We Create LA Program um, to transfer money from the UB uh, into the department. And uh, I, I, I support I support that transfer, uh, but I would uh, ask that uh, our uh, instructions today uh, include an instruction to the Department of Cultural Affairs to report to the relevant policy committee uh, on those programs, including likely expenses and program implementation elements, because these are new programs that haven't previously been considered. Second, um, I'd ask uh, that we add a position authority uh, at the Office of Petroleum and Natural Gas Administrator for one environmental supervisor two, one environmental specialist three, and one management analyst to support ongoing oil and gas regulatory work at the Board of Public Works, as well as six months funding for those positions from the amortization study of oil sites line item in the UB. Uh, and, and members, we've had much discussion about these positions. Uh, the reason that they weren't included in the original budget was at that time we did not have a petroleum administrator on board and it was my position at that time that we should allow the petroleum administrator to have an opportunity to weigh in on uh, on personnel needs and so forth in the office. Uh, we're now past that point. We have the petroleum administrator on board so I would uh, ask that we add those positions and uh, move that funding from the UB. So uh, with that, is there anything else, members? All right, then I think we can proceed to roll call on the FSR as amended. Councilmember Krikorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Price. Aye. Uh, four ayes. The report is approved as amended. Very good. Thank you very much. That will bring us uh, next to item number 10. Yes, uh, item number 10 is a CA report relative to including a city council in a proactive decision-making role for the COVID-19 emergency fund and use of funds from the unappropriate balance for the COVID-19 emergency response. Okay, and who do we have presenting on this? Ms. Huber? Hello. Yes, Patty Huber with the CAO. Good afternoon. Uh, the report before you recommends the transfer of funds from the UB uh, to the COVID emergency response fund. In addition, it also recommends a portion of those funds be transferred to the CAO to fund a contract for our American Rescue Plan uh, uh, reporting uh, support. Um, it also recommends that in this instance for the amount of 23.8, and I do need to make a correction, my first recommendation says 24.8, we should, there's a technical need to amend that to 23.8, I made a math error, so I apologize. Um, but that council in approving that $23.8 million transfer, approve it for the testing vaccination and FEMA reimbursement support categories, which are our most, um, basically our ongoing costs that we continue to occur in the COVID arena. Um, and uh, I am available to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. Members, questions? I, I had a, a couple, Super. First, um, in the the reference in, the, in recommendation number three to FEMA reimbursement support, um, 
can you describe what that I, I'm assuming from that language that that means administrative support for pursuing FEMA, FEMA reimbursements uh, rather than a broader category of things that might be reimbursable by FEMA. Is that is that correct? Correct. And, and I apologize for uh, glossing over that. Uh, we hired a consultant to assist our office in submitting the FEMA reimbursement projects. And as part of that, we are paying them a flat amount for each project submitted, as well as an, an, an incentive based on the timeliness of their submission, as well as then what does FEMA obligate of what they submitted. Um, because what they submit, FEMA might deny some of it, so it's based on what FEMA obligates. They would be eligible up to uh, 3% of that obligation. And there, it was just to, to deal with the fact that we had so much work that my one person just couldn't do all of it by herself. Great. That, that is perfectly understandable. Um, the uh, the one I guess concern slight concern I have uh, I don't think I have any concern about anything in these recommendations as being uh, entirely appropriate um, but we are now at a uh, we're now in a position where most of these expenditures that are related to COVID um, can be dealt with sort of through the normal budget process and through the normal oversight uh, process rather than in immediate emergency response, as was the case at the beginning of the pandemic when the mayor had to make uh, snap decisions uh, that sometimes didn't allow for de the deliberative process to take place. I think we're past that now. We can see ahead. We can see what the needs are. We can anticipate uh, and, um, and more or less uh, budget for these things. At the same time, uh, you certainly need to have uh, funds that are readily avail available for, you know, immediate expenditure on, on testing, vaccination, and so forth. So, um, is there any reason that we would need to move all of the twenty three point four million dollars at once, or could we say start with uh, ten million dollars out of the UB, and then when that's reported back to us, uh, provide you know, what the next uh, tranche of that, that funding. Is there any reason we couldn't do that just so that the committee is able to maintain some degree of awareness of the expenditures and oversight? That is certainly something that you um, could do if you so chose. Um, in my report, I sort of outlined with the projections that the mayor's office provided on sort of where we see ourselves going. Um, the only thing that I, I would note that both for testing and vaccination, some of those costs are in fact costs that are being incurred by the fire department relative to sort of infrastructure needs at those locations, um, you know, the, the, the fencing and the um, bathroom facilities and other things that are there for the physical infrastructure, they incur those costs monthly and those are part of the projections. Um, and they do routinely come to us with the request to get those funds back. I would say those are really truly unbudgeted activities for the department. We didn't anywhere in the budget put money for that except here. Um, so I would like to, to ensure that we can, can, you know, provide these cash flow funds to the fire department regularly. But some of the other costs, uh, particularly for the vaccination program, are for the um, contractor that is uh, running the vaccine program. And um, we, again, have obligations to pay them. Okay. Right. So, so putting that in place just could leave us in a situation, depending on timing, where we're accumulating bills, and and to some degree are accumulating bills because of the timing of this report, which is okay. on me. Okay. Well, I don't necessarily want to see uh, see us accumulating bills. So um, maybe instead of ten million, just to give us a little bit of a margin of error, but still retain a degree of you know cost oversight why don't we make that uh 15 million dollars 
So I would uh, recommend then that we approve the CAO's recommendations as amended to reduce the transfer in recommendation number one to $15 million. And then for the remainder, we'll just ask that you come back and provide an additional report of, of status of, of how the expenditures are going. Um, sure. You want a standalone report, or would you be okay if that came through the FSR process? Yeah, no, the FSR would be fine, too. If the timing works with the FSR, the that would be fine, too. Sure. Uh, okay. I, I mean, but if you have a more urgent time need, come on back and let us know. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, members, anything else on this item? Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll on the item as amended. Councilmember Krukorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Absent. Councilmember Price. Aye. Four ayes. The item is approved as amended. Thank you. Uh, that'll bring us next to item number 19. Item number 19, Joint City Administrative Officer and Chief Legislative Analyst Report relative to necessary staff and funding for the printing and installation of Los Angeles Municipal Code Section 41.18, subsection C, signage. All right. And uh, who do we have reporting on this? Mr. Hirano? Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm David Hirano from the Office of CAO, and I believe I'm joined by my colleagues in the CLA, Karen Kalfayan, Maria Sousa Roundtree, and John Wickham. Um, as you may recall, on September 14th, the council instructed the CAO and CLA to report back on staffing and funding for the printing and installation of signs consistent with LAMC 41.18, subsection C, which makes it unlawful for a person to sit, lie, sleep, or store, use, maintain, or place personal property in the public right-of-way. Before you today is a re joint report from the CAO and CLA that accomplishes this, this task. In short, the report recommends both the use of city forces through the Department of General Services and a city contractor obtained by the Department of Transportation. As of the date of this report, the council had identified 116 locations for posting and the report estimates that the cost of posting each location may vary between $11,000 and $14,600. These costs include both uh, posting of permanent aluminum signs and temporary chloroplast signs, the assessment location, and the maintenance of the signs posted. However, it's critical to note that um, these estimates are very, very rough. Due to the quick response time requested for this report, we were not able to assess each individual location to determine the actual cost of posting. Instead, we were forced to estimate costs based upon a series of assumptions that may or may not apply to each location, um, but are easier to estimate. Therefore, the actual cost to post each location will be different. Um, in addition to the cost, the time required to post each location is unknown. We've taken um, some educated guesses at it, but we won't actually know until we get out in the field and, and begin the posting. Um, if you approve the recommendations in this report, the posting of signs can begin. Once that happens, we will be able to more clearly answer probably many of the questions that you currently have. I do wanna take a moment to say thank you to the Departments of Transportation and General Services and the City Attorney, and of course the CLA assistance in preparing this report. It was done very quickly and done very professionally, and we benefit from all their their knowledge and expertise. And my understanding is that we are all here today to help answer any questions you may have. Very good. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thanks for the report and getting it back so quickly. Uh, the one suggestion that I would have, I, I support the CAO's recommendations. Uh, the one suggestion I would have would be to add an additional instruction, uh, particularly with regard to the choroplast signage, um, because sometimes that may be appropriate, sometimes it may not be, sometimes it may be cost effective, sometimes it may not be, depending upon the circumstances. And it does take time and resources away from our, our goal of getting the, the metal signage up. So I would suggest that we add 
uh, an additional recommendation five to instruct the CAO to facilitate coordination between departments and council offices and uh, to fabricate temporary choroplast signage upon request from the council office that's implementing the resolution. Um, I think it's just important that the, the types of signage and, and how that gets implemented gets coordinated with a particular council office. Uh, members, any any questions or comments about this report? Yes, Mr. Hirana, did you want to speak to that? Well, I just wanted to make sure that I am clear in understanding the intent of your instruction, if possible. So if I understand that correctly, temporary signs would not automatically be posted to each side, but would wait for the request of an individual council office before they are um, considered that what I'm hearing? Right. Right. My, okay. my concern is that if we go and start printing a bunch of choroplast signs, we're taking time away and money away from this longer term process um, when, you know, in, in many locations, it just may not be appropriate at all. We know that they'll be gone in a day. Um, it, it may be harder to post those than to, to just wait for the metal signs. There may be, may, might be a more robust street engagement process that's already underway in a particular location. So there's no big rush on the signs. There could be a lot of variables that the council office will know that, you know, the departments may not be as, as aware of. Okay. Thank Mr. you. Price. Mr. Chair, uh, David, thanks for that little report. Uh, this is something we all are watching very closely. It just seems though, man, but you know, to say between 10 to 15,000 bucks, is good. that seems like an awful lot of money per, uh, sign. I mean, I know there are lots of uncertainties, but um, you know, I agree with the chair. We need to figure out a way to kind of bring the cost down, or at least the immediate the immediate bump. Uh, any thoughts? What what you know? Then what, what's the range going to be? You think is it going to be around the ten thousand dollar range? And let's, as we settle into it. And and lastly, why do we have to outsource this stuff? We can't do this in house, even if it's you know gradual. Can we figure out a way to do it in house? Uh, Councilman, so the two questions you have, um, I think, yes, the costs are high, and yes, they are, um, they're not as closely refined as we'd hope they would be. <laughs> there are some sites where we would expect the cost to come in much lower. Um, as the chair pointed out, if we don't need to post temporary signs, the cost will come in lower. Um, for the purposes of estimating, we assumed that a typical site would cost, would require 20 signs and rec need five replacement signs. So a printing of 25 signs. And now whether that's 10 signs required and 15 replacement signs, the mix is almost irrelevant. We, so we assumed about 25 signs per site. Um, if there are fewer signs required at that site and there are no replacements needed or fewer replacements needed, that cost is gonna come down dramatically. Um, also, you know, if there are no security issues at that site, the cost will come down. If there, if we're able to get to a place where the metal prices and come down, um, those costs will come down. Our hope is that almost all the sites will get delivered for something less than that, but we couldn't promise you that given the short amount of time we had to do this assessment. Um, and you're so you're assuming the sites are going poles or going to be on the fence or how? What's well, we're assuming that at each location, there will be a mix of opportunities for posting signs. In some cases, we're going to have to take advantage of the opportunity to post a standalone sign um, with a standalone post with a sign on it. In other uh, cases, we may be able to take advantage of an opportunity to post on an existing pole, like a street lighting pole, or maybe the parking sign or something else that's located there. Um, but that will be part of the discourse that we have with the city attorney and the council office on each location, location by location, as to how those signs go up and, and what they're used for. So um, we do expect there will be a mix. And to the ex extent that there is a mix, the price could come down. Yeah. And do you envision that each sign will be the same or there may be two or three versions of the sign or what, what's the... We expect each sign will be the same. Um, right now, the sign is estimated to be 12 by 36. It's estimated to be printed in Spanish and English. 
It's, it has a template that um, Mr. Buckner of our office and Valerie Flores of the city attorney's office are working on developing so that it can be applied to all locations. And um, that template will vary by location. Each location will have um, the majority of the template will be the same, but there will be a separate map uh, identifying the specifics of that location. There will be a separate um, implementation date whereupon the a person cannot um, fly sleep or in that in that public right away, and there may be a separate council file as well. But other than those three items that I'm aware of, the rest of the sign will be very standardized. So it is our hope that each location will come in well below this, um, just like it's your hope. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Otherwise, uh, you know, it will be another backlash. Yes, and the, the answer to your question about contractors versus city staff is we want we identified both options and it came out to be very close in price. We can't tell the difference really until we get out on the field. So given that there are already 116 locations backed up, we wanted to put as many resources on the ground as, as possible, as quickly as possible. And we also want, we're going to use it kind of as a live laboratory to test two things. One, the, pr the price and see who, who does it for a better price and two, the timing, who can get them out there faster. So those two things we're kind of, we're kind of going to uh, assess as we move forward. And then we will look at that and return with a longer term or permanent strategy based upon the outcome of, of, of both function, uh, both alternatives. Um, well, thank you. We're pulling, we're pulling for you all the way. So good luck. But, and my understanding also is that there are, you know, there are hiring issues in this whole process as well. So um, we may or may not be able to find enough employees on both sides, of, or both alternatives to do this. So we're, we're trying to maximize the opportunities. Of course, if city staff comes in less expensive or um, becomes in faster, we will lean that direction, as you know. Yeah. Well, you know, don't and don't forget to charge a local hire also. Yeah, and as I will a, tell you that you know, city staff pool. were very professional pool, in right? helping prepare this report as well. So that, you know, they they did show their best, put their best foot forward in, in helping to prepare this. Report. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I know it's uh, you know requires some skill, but I think that the, some of our local folks have that skill already. So we have they to do. Try to take advantage of it. Yeah. They do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price, Mr. Blumenfield. I mostly echoing what Mr. Price said. I mean, the, 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 it's it's really hard to swallow this price tag um, for signs. And my hope is that you know we're kind of we're authorizing these funds, we're putting them out there because we need to get moving on this. But that um, you know you're going to come back with a much you know much better experience and much less. I mean, the idea that we're that we're we're setting aside money potentially for security seems crazy to me too. It's sort of we're putting up signs. We don't need security for signs. And if there's a problem, that's, that's why you call the cops. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, but what, I, you know, I'm willing to put it out there and then we'll get the report back afterwards of how the money was spent. And, and, and ideally you're going to be coming back saying, yeah, we only spent $200,000. we got all the signs up. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I, I am too. That, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, I think one of the, the challenges when you are, when you're, whether you're a GSD and say staff or whether you're a co city contractor in bidding a job with very little definition where you aren't able to go out and actually walk the job sites and come up with specifics is you're going to be a little conservative and you're going to put in things you're going that um, you don't know about with the expectation or the hope that it doesn't exist. So I think both sides were a little bit conservative. I, I'm really hopeful that we can actually deliver these things for less. As for security, um, you know, one of the security concerns was are there going to be people um, at the site that are going to be objecting, people who are already camping who may be objecting to it. We don't think so. And we think that if there are some of those locations, they may be able to be handled by asking for help from our um, senior lead officers or street use investigators or others in, in the city that can help with that. But until we actually do it, we don't know, sir. So there is a you know small set aside for that, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And just just like the assumptions about 
polls, putting up polls. I mean, like I know at least for, for the sites, the underpasses in my district, you know, there's, there's polls already, there's street, you know, there's plenty of places where you can put signs without having to put a pole on the ground. So, um, you know, both along the wall itself and, and the various street signs that are already out there. So my, my hope is that this, the number will be much, much less. So my understanding um, is that the, the location of the signs will be dictated by the, the code section itself, which describes the drawing of a radius around the location. And that radius, wherever it intersects the public right of way is where a sign would go. Now the sign could be brought back inside the radius if need be, but it, generally that radius is gonna define where the sign would go. So. Um, that'll be a process of working with the council office and city attorney on a location by location basis to make sure we're doing that. We, that the P, fine folks in general services and our contractor are doing it right. I'm not doing it, but you know, um, and so we'll learn as we go. Right. And it's, it's an up to, so, you know, it's not like it has to be exactly 500 feet. If there's a stop, I know it can't be more than that, but if there's a street right. sign that's you know, 480 feet, that's where you put the sign. Like it just, as opposed to putting up a new pole another 20 feet away. It just, like, I, yeah, just and hope, I hope there's going to be rationality in this process. Well, I noticed Valerie Flores in the state attorney raised her hand. So maybe she'd be the best to answer that question, sir. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, yes, I do believe that um, there will be some cost saving opportunities. And um, given the amendment that um, the uh, the placement of signs should be done in coordination with the council office. So for example, on an underpass site, you might just want to post the underpass itself with a couple signs on each side of the street, maybe four, because that's really the area you're targeting. Whereas it, near a school, you might want every single street intersection at the 500 foot radius. And so those might require more signs. And in formulating the estimates, we did look to um, how many signs on average are put up for school safety zones. And so that's how, that's how that was uh, categorized. But again, if it's all right with the council office for an underpass, for example, if you just wanna have four signs up because you're really just focused on that underpass area, and not so concerned about 350 feet away, again, that would be a huge cost savings. And I do believe that we will work with the council offices to make sure they feel we have sufficient signage, but not, uh, you know, an overabundance of signage that we don't think we, the council office doesn't think we actually need. And we will absolutely um, try to get our contractor and city folks to look for existing polls. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. Mr. DeLeon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, David, um, you may have answered the question already. And I apologize, Mr. Yeah. Chair, uh, to you as well as my colleagues if I'm uh, being a little repetitive. Uh, the budget line item that you have is $1.5 million up to $2 million. And you may have stated this already, but um, what what do you guesstimate that number, uh, that that budget item? Uh, but I'm not sorry, not the budget item, but that that dollar figure on on, on a per sign cost. Um, oh, I have to, I don't recall exactly on the the two bids and what was per sign, but the locations were that we were looking at were anywhere from eleven thousand to fourteen thousand per location to put about. If to produce about 25 signs per location. You know, when we talk about signs, we're talking about the signs that we see every day, like uh, like don't park here, um, uh, unloading yeah. and loading those metal signs, right? Yeah, so they're made out of aluminum, correct. Aluminum, okay. They're a little bit and larger, and they're 12 by 36, so it's a little bit larger than a no park. So 12 inches, 12 inches by... 36 okay they're sort of kind of <laughs> large ones right there yeah um, yes we could save money if the sign size were to be decreased but that's what we're we've estimated is 12 by 36. so the question is 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 in, in two languages uh, both spanish as well as english correct 
And um, so what is the sign, the per sign then cost again, one more time? Um, let me pull that up here. Um, the cost per sign is a, anywhere from about $35 to $50. Uh, if okay. it's permanent metal sign. Okay. So 35 to $50, that's the sign and, and labor and installment, uh, or that's just the, the labor of the manufacturing of the sign itself. Okay. I'm sorry. The 35 looks like it's the sign, uh, that's made out of chloroplast and the $50 is a permanent metal sign. So. Oh, $50. Okay. $50 for the metal. And for the $35, which one would that be? The temporary coroplast sign. Okay. It's sort of kind of like that plastic with those sort of kind of. Uh, yeah. It's like what our colleagues put up in their yard when they're having, when there's an election going or that is, they want to advertise a yard sale or. Gotcha. 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 Okay. I, I know which ones you're talking about. Okay. Those are 35. The metal signs, uh, 12 by 36, uh, roughly $50. And that is the the manufacturing of it and the labor, everything, right? And then the installment of the sign. No, that was just, I, that's just the manufacturing. And on top of that, you would have labor for either installing the sign um, on a standalone post, which includes having to create, you know, manufacture the post and install it, or by installing the sign to existing poles with some sort of banding uh, mechanism and the labor associated with that. Um, and then the cost per location also has an assessment time frame because we'll need to go out. And someone will need to assess the location itself and determine how many signs need to be produced and what method of attachment will be used. So someone have to walk the site and say, I can post here, but I can't post here and come up with a strategy for doing so before the signs are produced. And then um, there will also be maintenance requirements for each location because if somebody goes out there damages the sign or put stickers over it so it's not readable somebody will have to go back out and replace the sign or clean it and so those are those kinds of costs are all wrapped up into our cost estimate all variable by location is my guess and david how do you um either guesstimate or project the number of signs that are needed is it with the current number of 41.18 motions that have been submitted collectively um, by the the council members, more some more than others, but are you sort of kind of uh, guesstimating, projecting what those uh, numbers are? So, uh, and, and, and this is where I'm going, but go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, we it's been kind of a moving target lately. So, uh, you know, we stopped at 116 as in terms of our ability to come up with an, an overall estimate. But we also realized that every location was going to be different. And we, if we couldn't go out and see every location, we had to use some general assumptions to help us actually create a cost estimate. And so some of this, those are, we know those assumptions may not hold to every location, but it at least allows us to create an estimate that can be compared. Um, and so what we did is we determined that we were going to use 20 active signs and five um, five uh, spare signs as our kind of our our, our uh, standard and we were going to use two different standards for posting them and that would be banding them to existing lights or putting in a separate pole altogether they they have two different very cost uh, two very different cost profiles those two activities so we wanted to make sure we got both of them um, and then obviously having a sign big enough to have Spanish and and, um, and English and meet the requirements of the city attorney. So, and then, you know, we asked for both parties, GSD and the contractor to tell us what it would take to maintain those signs and what it would take to obviously go out and assess them and, and create a strategy for each location on putting those signs up. So all that went into those estimates um, and everything that is in there is a guess. If you are reacting to a feeling that this is, maybe not as accurate as we had hoped it would be, I would agree with you. Um, we would have like maybe liked to 
go out and actually see every site and do an assessment every site, but there was not time for that in the preparations report. Do, uh, do other city signs that are posted for a whole variety of, of reasons, whether they're issues with traffic, um, uh, don't park here, um, parking hours from X amount, you know, X hours to X hours, or permitting parking only from X hours, like, do, do they all require the same, you know, care and, you know, upgrades or upkeeping as, as this uh, budget item? I, I'm not, I might need some help with answering that question accurately. Um, I don't, uh, I, I, I won't hold you to it, David. I just, I'm just sort of kind of guessing. I, I, I mean, I do know there's certain standards for signs that are in the public right away, including um, the height they're posted. But uh, maybe my colleague from DOT could help with that. Jake Kim. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, Jake Kim from LA DOT. Hey, Jake. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think this one is a little bit different in that in that first 14 days, we do expect potentially uh, signs being damaged or defaced or graffitied. And so uh, if it's a normal parking sign, for example, we'll post it and we'll just do regular maintenance as they, you know, fade over time. But in this instance, uh, there's some additional uh, maintenance that needs to be done. And I think that's why the costs are going to be a little bit higher. Uh, and so that would probably, probably be the biggest difference is that in that first 14 days, most likely we'll have to make a second pass and to take care of any uh, damage to face or uh, graffiti signs. Which would make this a different situation, obviously. Uh, so you do anticipate. Um, that, that was included in, in our estimate. Immediate sure damage to the signs uh, by whoever made damage to those signs yep. throughout the Okay. And where I was, you know, David, and where I was going with this, obviously, is, and I think uh, Mr. Blumenfeld and um, Mr. Curran Price had um, uh, said it uh, that the price seems a little exorbitant um, in, 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 in what we're dealing with. Obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a hot issue, you know, the 41.18, um, highly debated, you know, um, how they contested by some folks, you know, uh, within the city of LA for a whole variety of reasons, but we do know it's a, it's a polarizing issue and sort of kind of that, that, that number no, uh, five upwards up to $2 million. Well, this is, no, we'll you after this, right? Uh, so this is 11 this. And whatever that number may be is a little, uh, it seems a little exorbitant, you know, on, on, on face value. Um, uh, I, I would recommend, you know, obviously through the chair, uh, a suggestion that uh, you be as, as, as detailed as possible. I know it's a little tougher because this is a different, unique situation um, in terms of contingent on the council members themselves, right? And how many they submit, you know, uh, per their district, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's sort of kind of this moving target that's that's fluid. Um, but it does just seem like a high number, um, a, a very high number. And obviously, you, the city, the council members here present want to really focus on the the solutions, whether in the immediate, it's uh, a temporary, you know, um, non congregate you know, type of housing, eventually permanent side. But it seems steep. I know that it's a moving target, you know, contingent on, on the members themselves of how many motions they're submitting and what you need to go back to revise budget numbers and uh, the anticipation of, you know, a, a vandalism of the science himself, you know, which, which is unfortunate, you know, um, but it is what it is. I appreciate it, but I just want to let you know that it's a, try if, if, if through the chair. Uh, if you do come back, you know, soon uh, with the revision, if you can be a little more as, as detailed as possible, which would be helpful to, to, to us, I think. Understood, sir. Um, the two things that are, well, that are critical to being more accurate in terms of cost is time. Uh, and resources, and we just don't have that in this in this space. But we will, we can commit to coming back and letting you know how those things are going to play out in the field. And and we're hoping that every location is is a lot less expensive, and that what the costs we're looking at right now are really just a reaction to to two um, bidders reacting to a lot of unknown. Uh, and as we get out there, that things will will, will settle in at a much lower you know cost. 
I think the other thing is we will, both parties will develop a level of expertise with 116 locations to address that will help create some efficiencies as we move forward. So we'll really get to see what, <laughs> what this looks like. And I, I agree with you. You know, I, I work for the CAOs. We don't want to see this to be this expensive. <laughs> so um, we're very hopeful that it'll come in lower. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and obviously, if the, the chair allows it, uh, maybe you can come back um, with uh, uh, and give us an update. Yeah, we, we will fully expect to have updates on actual performance because I don't think I don't think there's any way to get a more accurate estimate until we actually start getting out there in the field and you know doing the work. So, but we'll certainly want to monitor the progress as we go and and find whatever cost efficiencies. Uh, we can have, and I hope there'll be there'll be many, as as the members have described. Mr. Blumenfield, I, I hand is still up. Okay. Anything else, members? Just one quick note, since the yes. uh, report was issued, another eighteen locations were added to the council file, so uh, we are now up to one thirty four, I think. Yeah, it's going to continue to be a continue. Yeah, <laughs> a work in progress. Uh, okay, very good. Um, so if there's nothing else then on this members, um, I mentioned uh, a, an amendment to add a fifth recommendation. Uh, with that amendment, uh, let's go ahead and call the roll. Councilmember Kukorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember De Leon. Councilmember Rodriguez, absent. Councilmember Price. Aye. This item is approved as amended. Very good. Thank you, Thank members. You. Thank you, Mr. Rano and team. Um, all right. According to my records, that that completes our open session items. Is that correct, Mr. Sa? That's correct, Mr. Chair. All right. Then we can go ahead now and proceed. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the Budget and Finance Committee has completed its work in closed session, uh, there being no other business before the committee.